This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus Episode 703. This week, we welcome Jeremy Beagle, Senior Principal Scientist at SDII Global, we're going to talk about mold assessment and restorative drying redefined. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They are the reason we can continue doing the show. Don't forget after the show to continue the discussion at afterthoughts.iaqradio.com, sponsored by First On Site. IAQ Radio Plus Marquee Sponsor is First On Site Property Restoration at firstonsite.com. IAQ Radio Association Sponsors are ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at ACGIH.org. AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org. IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, RIA, at restorationindustry.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA at EIA-USA.org. IAQ Radio Industry Sponsors are AEML Laboratories at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com. TSI Inc. at TSI.com. Tramex Meters at tramexmeters.com and Healthy Indoors Magazine at healthyindoors.com And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Bob Spielfogel from Brookline, Massachusetts, who was first to identify apparatus for spray coating articles as the subject of U.S. patent number 2,247,963. The IQ Radio Trivia question for today, June 16, 2023, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here is today's IAQ radio trivia question. Whose plaque is number 2563 on Hollywood's Walk of Fame? Back to you, Joe. Okay, today's guest is Jeremy Beagle. He is the Senior Principal Scientist and CIH with SDII Global with over 18 years progressive experience performing causation assessments pertaining to moisture, fungal growth, and other indoor environmental concerns in the built environment, as well as providing expert witness testimony. Jeremy currently is also the first vice president of IAQA and vice chair for the IICRC S530 Mold Assessment Standard. Welcome, Jeremy. Great to have you on. Hey, thank you, guys. I'm, it's really it's an honor and a pleasure. It's, uh, you know, we've been looking forward to this show. Um, we called it Mold Assessment and Restorative Drying Redefined. And this was um, based on a couple of presentations you did at, I guess that was at the Experience? It was, yeah. Okay. Let's talk first a little bit about your current position. What do you do for SDII? Uh, so my primary task is causation. Uh, we I'm generally dealing with the causation of moisture-related concerns in a structure uh, in mold growth. Um, as well as I get involved with um, smoke damage assessments and as well as, you know, any other um, unique chemical type exposures or anything like that. Um, we primarily deal with um, insurance carriers or our primary clients. So we get involved in a lot of um, pre-litigation as well as litigation um, disputes on extended damage. How, how big of an outfit is SDII Global? We are we are primarily we are nationwide. Um, our biggest presence is in Florida as well as in Texas, but we have a network of professionals throughout the country to uh, to handle. So I think we're about 150 um, in-house type employees, and then we have a network throughout the rest of the country. Is it all environmental work, or do you have other 
So yeah, so it's uh, it's it's actually it's primarily um, structural. So we okay. we're, we are primarily consisted of uh, professional engineers. I'm one of three scientists in the group that we handle the uh, um, the environmental type, water damage, things like that. And then we also actually have a geotechnical side, which was what the company was kind of based upon. So they're looking at sinkholes and other things like that. So we okay. we dive into a de decent amount of um, different problems. Sounds a little like an old company I used to work for, PSI. They they did a lot of uh, a lot of construction type work, and now I'm I'm curious. I didn't know. Uh, are you familiar at all with what's going on with the uh, building? And was it in Iowa that that kind of started to fall down there? Um, is that the type of thing your group would get involved in? Yeah, so a lot of our engineers would get involved in it. I actually haven't seen much conversation on that, but you know when we had the FIU bridge collapse down here in South Florida, where I'm at. Um, also with the um, Surfside Towers, you know, there was a lot of conversation. But yeah, they'll they get involved with a lot of the different failure assessments. And now we've got I ninety five in Philadelphia. What a mess, huh? <laughs> you know, my uh, my wife just drove up to Pennsylvania yesterday, and she 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 knows exactly what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Too well. Huh? Yes. Well, on that one also, I haven't heard much about it, but there was a lot of smoke from that fire. I mean, that was a gasoline fire. And I would imagine there's quite a bit of uh, cleanup necessary in surrounding homes and businesses. Yeah. Yeah. There and you get involved in that type of work as well, huh? Yeah. For me, it's generally it's primary residential structure fires. So okay. we, we also also have a, our fire investigators. So they'll do, they'll do the um, cause and origins of the fires as well as, and then I generally come in from the environmental side and do the smoke damage assessments. Um, and that's generally where that range is. Down here in South Florida, I don't get too much involved with wildfires, um, but we, you know, outside of the obviously out west and areas like that, we would. And how much of your work is expert witness related? I would say it's probably about sixty percent, and oh. it's all expert work. But a lot of forty percent of it's probably pre litigation. So again, when you're when you're doing work for you know, a carrier, or even if you're on the other side of that, you know, you, you might be involved before it goes to litigation. So they need to know what the problem is and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. So we get involved in that. And then the rest of the work is when it's in litigation, then we get involved with either actually going out to the site, reassessing it, um, or just trying to render an opinion based upon documents that have been re or documents that have been provided. And, and you do a lot with insurance carriers, and there's been a, you know, well, that, since Cliff and I have been in this industry, there's always been a battle between the restorers and the insurance industry. I don't know. Maybe maybe it wasn't as bad way back in the day, Cliff, but um, it seems like that's gotten, at least from what I see on some of the chat rooms on the restoration sites, it, it seems like they at least feel like the insurance companies have really been pushing harder and harder to limit their claims. Do you see that? Yeah, I don't. So for me, again, doing this for almost, well, you know, 19 years now, um, I never really looked at it that way. But what I, what I have seen is probably more of an increased scrutiny over time. So one aspect of that is where I'm located, right? We're down here in South Florida. A lot of times that's the wild, wild west of things. And I think what what becomes problematic is you have companies that are providing work with nothing to substantiate it. So but when that balloons, out into just a, a bigger problem or it's just more and more of it, well, then the scrutiny is going to come down harder on the people that are actually doing the work and doing it right. Um, so I, I think from that perspective, that's kind of what I've seen over time is, is more of a scrutiny. But, you know, I don't get involved in claims. I don't actually even know much about insurance policy. I have to read mine when I have a problem at my house. So. <laughs> but, you know, from that perspective, it's just more of I, I have seen a greater scrutiny. Okay. And that, let's go over to the uh, Indoor Air Quality Association. I, are you the first vice president? So you may, may be president here at, at some maybe, point? Yeah, maybe someday. But <laughs> yeah, so uh, we actually we have a lot going on. It's, it's an exciting time. And uh, our first is our, you know, our annual meeting will be in Tampa, Florida next year. And that's the okay. February 9th or 6th through the 9th. And yesterday we did have a call for abstracts. So anybody that's listening, you know, Now's the time. Get an abstract in. Um, I know for me personally, I've presented there many times over the years, and I really enjoy it, even just from bringing my perspective and having people sit in. And then when it's over, you know, you get criticism. Either some people agree with it, some people don't, but you get to hear um, thoughts about what you're doing. 
Um, so I really like that. And I'd like to see, hopefully we get a lot of people that submit really interesting abstracts. Um, we are in, we have revamped the find a pro. So that's a vehicle for leads for our membership. Um, I know even for me, I generally get like five or six calls a month off of that, um, down here in the South Florida area. So if you are a member of IEQA, you got to update your profile. Um, and, but we've kind of made that more user-friendly for the general public and for other users to, to get the people, um, the school mold standard, for those that are familiar with that, it's something that's been in process for a long time. And I see that Jay Stake is on this call and we had to kind of rip it out of his arms and, but it's, it's done and it's, it's ready to be released shortly. So I know that everybody's really excited about that. And then we're also in the process of revamping the chapters. Um, you know, it's, it's been one way for a while and now we're trying to look to see how we can better that and get more participation in the chapters. So and then even in the end, even new educational content. Um, I know we just started a, a series science for non-scientists. Um, I know the first talk was about vapor pressure, which is something a lot of people may not understand. But when you're assessing buildings and moisture related problems, um, it's something you do need to have a, a good understanding of. So that's that's a lot of what we have going on now. It's, it's pretty exciting. All right. Now, the reason uh, there's a couple of reasons we wanted to get you on. One was just your background and experience. And I see your name around a lot. And then. In, uh, I guess that would be February now, you were at the uh, event that uh, Pete Consigli and um, AEML and others put together, the Andy Osk Building Science Symposium. Is that where you did these, uh, talk to Pete? And then you did these two presentations at the Experience. Where was that this year? That was in Fort Lauderdale. So we Pete, had a, Pete and John had a workshop um, after the uh, symposium. And it was really kind of Florida based. And we talked a lot about some different topics associated with hurricanes and he kind of asked me to talk about qualifications and mentorship and things like that. And then that led to um, the restoration conference where, you know, I more want to talk about redefining expectations of mold assessments, um, you know, a lot from restoration contractors to the general public to even, you know, insurance professionals. And then, and another aspect that I brought into it was, you know, what we see a lot, again, when you're, when you're doing a lot of insurance related work, you are being asked to critique a lot. So you're looking at a lot of things. This happened. This is what was done. Is this right? Is this wrong? Was it warranted? And the one thing that we started to kind of see over the years was the mold assessment, you know, being part of the restoration process. So from the restorative drying to the mold remediation. And, you know, when you look at best practice generally when you're when the contractor is going out you know they're looking for pre-existing water damage contamination uh things like that so they can have an idea how to start drying and what was what's kind of happening a lot is so they do that they go out and either maybe they set up stabilization just to set up some dehues and start drying until they can get a third party to come out and take a look confirm their thoughts um or sometimes they actually start drying and then now you set up an opportunity where maybe you're cross-contaminating the property. You haven't even had anybody really come out to look. Um, but then, so then what would happen was then maybe a couple, a month later, everything that was then dried was all ripped out because of the mold assessment. And then when we're looking at what these mold assessments were, they were nothing but somebody really going out, taking some pictures um, and some samples, whether it be, you know, spore trap air samples or some sort of surface like a swab. So it was kind of problematic because it's like, why are we, how do we get here? Because generally if, if we're finding a problem during the dry out, we want to document that, remove those building materials and then continue with what we can restore. I um, mean, it was kind of going the other way around. So that was another concept that, that I brought to the table to talk about. Yeah, it was a little backwards in some ways. So these are called uh, mold assessment, restorative drying and mold remediation, dry sample remove. And the second one was mold assessment, restorative drying, and mold remediation, redefining mold assessment. Now, I'm sure there was some overlap. Which one do we want to start with? Because I'd like what, what we had talked about doing, and I think it's a great idea, is to give a quick overview of these two presentations for our audience. Yeah, let's start with the uh, the redefining the expectations of the mold assessment. So, All right. you know, what really is old is, is new. Everything comes around. I think most folks that you know, are watching this or that are competent in this industry really understand what a mold assessment is, which is, it's the, it's the inspection over the sampling. 
And what we still continue to have a problem with this day, at least what I can see through my daily job, is we have a, a sampling first perspective where we're going in and we're collecting a couple samples. We may take a couple pictures and then we provide a really scaled down uh, report that actually really isn't site specific. It provides really generic um, recommendations for remediation. So it's we need to redefine this expectation from the, you know, just from the general public, from the property owner, from a tenant, from somebody um, working in an office space. You know, I was talking before about the calls that I get through the Find a Pro. A lot of times I'm, I'm unable to help these folks, but I spend a half hour, 45 minutes talking to them about, look, if you reach out to somebody and they're going to tell you they're going to come out, take a couple samples and we'll let you know what your problem is. You don't want that. You want to ask them what their process is, make sure that they're going to perform you know, a, a detailed inspection. And then if they are going to perform some sort of sampling, then it's based upon that. And we, we don't see that anymore. I mean, well, I shouldn't say that. We just don't see it. It's generally somebody taking one air sample inside versus one outside. Or maybe they're collecting a couple of swab samples and they're, they'll say like the home is in a state of elevated fungal ecology based upon a one centimeter squared swab sample. So when you're looking at this, like, what's the what's the benefit of the property owner? Even when you're involved in an insurance matter, it's not helping anybody because now you're going to be scrutinized. There's going to be somebody like me on the other side looking at this like, why? what purpose was this for? Um, so that's kind of what the whole redefining, even from the insurance side of it for insurance pro uh, professionals. I recently started a, uh, a three-part series for Property Casualty 360, which is a, you know, it's an insurance-related journal and talking about redefining these, even from their perspective. I think a lot of people think that mold inspections are something that's really easy, but most of us that do these, they're extremely complex, right? Because there could be a lot of different problems and structures have a lot of different ways moisture can get in there and it can grow. It's not just taking a sample. And again, unfortunately, that's just what it's, that's what it's associated with. It can be part of it. It's just not the primary fact of it. So Really, when we're looking at a mold assessment, what we need to determine is the origin and cause, or really the, the source of the moisture. That's primary, right? Because if we're gonna if we're gonna do the assessment, we're gonna figure out the problem. Then we got to give some direction on how to fix it, and it needs to be evidence based. We need to support this conclusion because if you don't, you're going to be challenged. And most of the stuff that we're seeing is not, you know, it's not really it's not evidence based. Um, you know, determination of the extent. So how much is there? You know, a lot of times we're not seeing that in these documents, and then. You know, provide some kind of detail in the report. What's the data? Did you collect moisture measurements, uh, RH, you know, whatever the problem may be, did you actually lead to an ability to determine the opinion on why? And then, you know, what's really frustrating is the, the lack of a site-specific protocol. So when you look at a lot of these reports, they're similar templates. I don't know if it's from an organization or if it's just a group of folks, but you have these templates and it's generally just a blanket. Here's some remediation. Remove the mold. Well, what mold? What's the extent? You know, nobody can do much with this. So what value is that providing to your client? Whether they're a property owner, whether a tenant, whether whoever they are, you know, we're, it's just, they lack so much. And I think that's where redefining expectations is important because you got to understand this thing is, can be complex. There's more to it than just sampling. And that's really what this was about. I think we go to the next slide. Well, you're, you're trying to redefine these expectations, which I think is great, but isn't a big part of the problem that consumers expect a mold inspection for less than a thousand bucks or 500 yes. or something yes. around? They expect you to, to sample. That's the first thing that every time I pick up the phone, I need not even a, hey, my name is this. It's, can you come sample my house? And I say, sample for what? And then they say, well, for mold. I'm like, well, is that your only problem? So, you know, again, even IEQ problem, most people associate IEQ with mold when we know it's it's more vast than that. And then, yes, you bring up the price. And it's not, it's not. Less than $1,000 isn't going to get you much. And that's what happens is you pay that, right? You pay $500, $600, then you're left with a document. And this is really prominent in the real estate industry. Somebody comes out, takes a couple of samples, they give them this document, it doesn't tell them anything. And then they got to pay somebody to come back out on the back end now you're paying a lot of money if you want to get a fixed rate. So you're right. It is difficult to do it. And they are complex. That is the most important thing is that it, it takes some education and knowledge to, you know, really give a good product. 
Well, and they're especially complex when it's it's the re- you're out there as a result of a water damage event, and you're trying to differentiate between what was pre-existing and maybe caused by something else, and what was caused by that event. You can't do that for you know with a couple of samples and and a couple of hours in the building. It's very no, difficult. And, and you know, in all reality, that's that's a, and I'm glad you brought that up because. Most of these times, especially when you're going to residential, actually, really anything, residential, commercial, we all live differently. You know, we have deferred maintenance. We let things go, but they're convoluted. And when we're going, so say I'm going out to a residential structure and I'm looking, you know, the claim is for, uh, you know, they had a water supply line leak underneath their sink. And you get out there and there's extensive mold growth everywhere. And you find 18 other things that are leaking in the same area. Now it's tough because it's, how do you separate this out? Right. Um, how can you say you can't really say most has happened because it's something that just you found a day or two ago. So they are, they're very convoluted and they require time and effort to, to piece them out. And generally when I'm talking to a property owner, I tell them this could be multiple site visits. I'm sure most people do as well. You know, you're just you're trying to explain what the nature of this thing is going to be. Well, another thing that I, I would like to follow up on is because I know you used to work with Ralph Moon and mm-hmm. uh, Ralph did a lot of research on like the length of time it takes for a a piece of wood to get moldy, you know, things like that. And and a lot of that doesn't exist for people like, like us to go in and say, okay, you know, this has been wet for how many days? It's kind of hard to tell. Um, are you, I don't remember if Ralph, I thought he was with SDII, but maybe it was a different group. Is yeah. anybody in your group still doing that type of research? We don't really do that at, at- at SDI. So when I, I left, I worked with Ralph for 13 years and um, we had moved when I had left, they were continuing to do the research. So now one of the reasons why I left was because we kept merging with companies, you know, we were HSA and then, we, you know, we so on and so forth, but they're still doing it. Um, you know, that was the unique thing about the insurance because we, we went from assessing mold generally catastrophe work is what I started on back in 2004 when I got into this industry and we already knew the pro- what the problem was. It's like, what was the extent and what needed to be done? And then over time, once the, the storm work kind of would slow down and then the claims would come in for mold problems or water problems, then the question became, well, what's it from? And then the question became, how long? So we, we shifted our focus to more of a forensic part of, of, of you know backtracking on what these losses were, which then led to the necessity to determine duration because from... Um, you know, when you're from a carrier perspective, different policies have different provisions for how long something can be wet. And that's what we were looking for and trying to understand that there wasn't much information out there. And that's what a lot of what Ralph had done was trying to help us. What, and we're not talking about, you know, years. We're talking about what can happen in a couple of weeks to right. maybe a month or two, because that's what these policy provisions were. But I know that they are still doing it over there. Ralph, I think Ralph's still involved with it. And then um, Nolan, he's over there doing a lot of work as well. So they're, they're still continuing with it. And a lot of these research projects, they are, you know, multi-million dollar projects with clean rooms and so on and so forth. I mean, he was he was doing some really valuable, and I'm sure he still continues to do some really valuable research for our industry. And I don't, I don't see it being that terribly expensive, like some of the, you know, chemistry of the indoor environment type of things. So it's not, I think it's more of having a good, um, uh, you know, study is your, is your, is your strategy, is your plan, you know, the actual research that you're going to do um, and then looking at it. And then, you know, there are, but there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of variables with the built environment, and especially when we're looking at different types of wood, different types of metals. So, but again, it's still trying to get an understanding of this. A lot of this stuff is kind of common sense. You can go in and look at it and be like, okay, yeah, this didn't happen in a week or two. But then when it, but then it gets that fine line of you're going to a couple of weeks to a month or two. Um, you know, and also gets to that line of, how do you know that? And that's always, how can you how prove that? Third, yeah. Yep. And how's it 13 days versus 14? And yep. so it's, but again, we're being asked and it's not, it's not an exact, you know, you're really estimating and it's, it's all multiple factors. It's not just one thing, you know, what's the nature of the source? What's the, yep. what's the conditions of the building materials? And then for those of us that are, you know, you know, fungi junkies, we want to know what's growing on the walls, you know, what's <laughs> the different types of fungi that we see there. Cause this is going to, you know, it's going to give us an idea of, of what this environment was like. 
Well, let me get let you get back to that presentation. The next slide, John. I, I got off on a tangent, but I thought it was an important one. Here we go. Yeah, so then this is just kind of, you know, what cause and origin is, you know, where did it originate from? What's the cause? You know, what's where's the moisture source? Can you tell us that? And not just somebody told me this. That's what a lot of them actually we see are. Well, they told me it was this. Okay, well, did you did you look at that? And this doesn't have to be complex. It can be very complex. And you may need to get somebody else to come out to help you with it. But in the end, you know, can you can you point to what the problem is? Because for the remediation side, we need to fix it. And then, you know, applying the scientific method, you know, we're collecting background information. We're collecting observational and measurable data on site. We're testing things, you know, we're, if we are gonna sample, you know, we're gonna sample. And then with all this information, we can come to a conclusion, not just, I took a couple of samples and here's my, you know, templated, you know, my, what, whatever, you know, the, the template language that a lot of them have. There's not much site specific to it. Let's go to the next one, John. Here we go. Okay, so this these is some really, real good points. Yeah, these are the end points. So the first bullet, I got to give a shout out to my guy up in Alaska, Martin Schwan. He says this a lot, and it's absolutely true. And I'm sure others do as well, but it's replaced the word mold with the word moisture. And that's a lot of what we're doing. When we're doing these mold assessments, we got to look for the moisture. That's part of it. In all reality, you know, you, you become an expert in this. When you're performing mold assessment, you're actually providing causation. You know, you're determining moisture sources so you can elevate yourself by doing this. Because we know when there is no moisture, there's no mold growth. So we got to identify the source of the moisture. The assessment is just not a collection of samples. And we got to continue to do this. We educate. A lot of us that go to the, the um, our associating, association annual meetings, um, chapters, you know, we, we do know this. Um, you know, we seek reaffirmation on what we're doing. Um, we may learn new things. It's just there's a lot of people out in the industry that need to get involved with this and understand this. And then, you know, in the end, our, our main purpose really needs to be to determine the source of the moisture. That's what we need to do. Not so much what's floating around in the air at that time. That can be a part of it. And it may need to be. And it's all good. Just get us a good inspection with it. Go to the next one, John. Or was that the last one in this set? Yeah, I think that was the last one on this one. All right. Let's, Cliff, real quick. It's almost halftime. I wondered if you had a follow-up. Yeah, I, I, I did. You know, going back to, you know, when you find mold and um, you can tell by looking at it that some of it has uh, been around for a long time and some of it is new. Uh, what do you what do you say when uh, the contractor says, well, it's here now? Well, it's and again, so this is the problem because it's not really it's it's between the other parties. So you have a you have an insurance company that has policies. They do whatever they do. You have the property owner who needs to get it fixed, and they're looking for somebody to help them with that. And they have, you know, insurance to help them with that. So it really all depends. But a lot of times we can look at the damage itself and say, okay, this was pre-existing. This happened. This had made it worse. And then it's really up to those parties involved. And like I said before, for me, I'm just laying it out. These are the facts. You guys all can take this information and use it how you see fit. A lot of people might disagree with it, but you know, in the end, it, it is what it is, but it's, it can be tough. And just by looking at it, you know, I, I think we all could say we could, we could do that, but we do want to at least sample and see what's growing um, in those areas. But, you know, for the most part, I, I understand that it's just who's responsible. And that's not really my decision. It's just, here's what it is. This is what it's from. And this is how much of it is there is. Do you, play, do you play golf or do you play softball or anything like that? I don't. I don't play okay. golf or softball. Okay. Well, I, what I want you to do is I want you to pick up a bat and I want you to take a swing at this question that we had from uh, a listener. What could I expect to pay for a comprehensive mold assessment to say a 1,000 square foot commercial building with an HVAC, AHU? What does the comprehensive mold assessment entail? So I think you're gonna you're gonna pay probably fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred for um, just like again a thousand square foot. That's just for the inspection, and then you're gonna have sampling right. on, on top of that. Right. Uh, so it could be anywhere. It could be up to again. It's the extent. So you could even be going up to five thousand right. even sure. more. So okay. it's, it really does depend, but you can't expect it to be much cheaper than that. Understood. Good. 
All right, thank you. All right, let's go to halftime, John. We'll be back with Jeremy Beagle in the second half of our show. We're talking about uh, redefining mold assessment. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site, your trusted, full-service disaster recovery and property restoration company at firstonsite.com. Our association sponsors are ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org, AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org, The Environmental Information Association, EIA's Multidisciplinary Membership, collects, generates, and disseminates information concerning environmental and occupational health hazards in the built environment at eia-usa.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, iicrc.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the oldest and largest nonprofit professional trade association dedicated to providing leadership and promoting best practices through advocacy, standards, and professional qualifications for the restoration industry at restorationindustry.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee, AEML. INC.com. Particles Plus. Feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us. ParticlesPlus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your mm-hmm. IAQ investigations. TSI.com. Tramex Meters. Developing modern dynamic moisture meters and humidity monitoring systems since 1974. Tramexmeters.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Healthyindoors.com. All right, we're back with Jeremy Beagle. John, let's jump right into that second presentation. We've got a couple slides we pulled out there to get through some of the key points. Okay, Jeremy, this one is on, this one is more, um, geared toward the structural drying side of things. And 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 I think it's kind of like your observation on what we've got kind of asked backwards, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, I think <laughs> okay. you're right. yeah, you are. And it's, um, again, this is, this is just from an observation of reviewing um, problems and, and, and critiquing. And what we, what we're seeing is from a drying perspective is that, you know, we get the mold assessment involved and, and I see it almost as a bridge from tearing out what we've tried already. So, you know, when we're thinking about drying, we're trying to remove the, you know, the water and humidity following the water release. We want to get the building materials back to an acceptable condition. We want to limit the secondary damage. So the process for the contractor is to go out and inspect, you know, you want to determine a source. Is there any pre-existing damage? Is there any contamination that in their expertise, they see whether it's mold growth, um, depending on the, the type of the water, you know, the source of the water, and then document those conditions. And then from that point, do we start to tear out building materials that aren't salvageable? Even building materials that just aren't salvageable because they're so degraded. Uh, we see that a lot as well. And then, you know, are we setting up the drying goals? And then, you know, let's remove these building materials that need to be. And I don't, I see that the, what is happening is we set up the drying, and this may be, um, you know, stabilization, just a, a few uh, dehumidifiers to while all the, all the parties are involved are coming to the, the structure. So, you know, we, we do that and then we're going to have a mold assessor come out because there's a concern about mold. I think that a lot of, um, you know, contractors really should have a pretty good idea of it. So what we also see, and you'll see a picture of it coming up is uh, where they actually institute the drying when there's contamination. And now we've set up, set up a condition where we're, we're cross-contaminating the property. So we now we dried and then we have the mold assessment. Maybe that occurs during drying or just after. And then after everything's dried, a month later, everything's being tore out. So this is backwards, right? We need to be tearing this out first, but this is an observation and it's just, you know, is it a, 
is it a double dip? You know, what is it? Like, why are we doing it? You know, if we're, if we're drying, we know there's a problem. Let's take care of that first. I think as long as you document and, you know, I don't need to speak to this. I think most, you know, competent restoration professionals understand the importance of documentation. If you document what you're doing, you're going to have less scrutiny. There's always room for scrutiny, but there'll be less of it. So if you document, you do well. And that's really, I think, one of the more important things that need to be done here. So if we go to the next slide. Hey, can I get a quick yeah. question? This whole stabilization thing, I don't I don't remember. I, was that kind of added in a later version? And Cliff, you're, you're more familiar with this than me. Is that kind of new to the S500? It's, I don't remember it being back there in like 2005, 2010. Somewhere along the way, the stabilization thing came into play. Cliff, do you know anything about that? I don't remember it being really in the first one in 1995. That's the one that I worked on. But um, I don't know. And I, th I think there's issues in terms of what does that term mean? You know, stabilization. Is it just relative humidity? Is it, uh, you know, is it shoring up the building? Is it putting a tarp on the roof? Is it extracting water? Is it, I mean, right. I, I would assume that's part of stabilization. You're getting any standing water out. But but uh, Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong. What, no, what is I, stabilization? I, yeah, I think Cliff, Cliff's right. What, what you're In this capacity, what you're doing is you're already moving water and then you're going to start to kind of dehumidify. Um, I see Scott on there, open up a window. Yeah, if you're in a dry climate. Um, but what you're trying to do is, is instead of just doing, you know, structural drying, you know, forcing air until you can get some of the parties involved. So I had a, I had a loss at my old house and, you know, they came out and we set up the dehus and we let them run for a day or two before the insurance company got out there and actually got dried pretty well during that period of time. One of the problems with, you know, quote unquote stabilization is when you see these extended, uh, run times, um, you know, weeks, months, so you know, that would indicate there's a, there's a problem in the process um, between whatever parties are involved. Um, so, but I think for me, generally just when I think of stabilization, it's just that removing water, you know, setting up some dehumidification for a couple of days where you get the parties involved. And I don't think it's in the S500, to be honest with you. I don't think they really talk. I think it's just more of an industry type of consideration. I can see how an insurance company would not be real thrilled with paying for a week of stabilization. Um, you know, uh, do you run into that often? Yeah, well, yeah, a lot of times when you're you're looking at some of this and it's, you know, was this necessary? But so there's a lot of moving parts to these. And, you know, a lot of times I don't know what's happened. You know, when was the insurance company notified? You know, did the restoration contractor, were they in contact with them? And they said, hey, you know, we started, you send somebody out. So there's, 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 there's reasons why I can, but I just can't see why it would be, you know, months or you know, I, I, really weeks, right? We sh everybody should be getting involved. So it, it, I think it's a case by case and you kind of got to see why it is. But I think a couple of days is, you know, if it's taking that to get the people out there to assess, then it, it may be useful. But again, if we're also doing it because we're afraid of contamination, if we document, then we can remove it. Well, I think also, um, this kind of crept into the lexicon with respect to hurricane response because they there weren't enough people to go out and do the inspections in a timely manner so they started to to use this term stabilization during that and, and maybe it started to creep into other types of projects too i don't know i'm just throwing that out there i think even from a catastrophe perspective if you document what you're doing you shouldn't have a problem getting paid i'm not going to say you're not i just i'm looking at this just from the outsider looking in, you know, if you're, if you're going to do this, you know, as long as you document, then you have support of why you did it. Um, people are going to argue. And again, like, I don't really get involved with what insurance companies pay or what they do. I'm looking at it from a common sense perspective. If you can't get somebody out there, well then document and, and remove and go and do what you need. You know, under the terms of, under the terms of the policy, uh, you know, the policy holder is required to take steps to, mm -hmm segregate good from bad uh take steps to prevent further damage and that's right so on and so forth so i think if, if your stabilization is, you know falls within those categories i think it should be covered but you know if, if it's a 
you know, visibly a total loss. You know, it's a total loss. Your inclination is it's going to be a total loss. You really shouldn't waste a lot of time and effort trying to dry it and then yeah, right. be embarrassed later when they have to take it out. Oh, okay. So this really coincides with what we talk, what we we're talking about with it being backwards. You know, even we can look to the standards and they tell us, you know, if it's there, don't, you know, don't do things that are going to uh, disturb any contamination, you know, set up containment, tear it out and then and move on. Um, as long as you, you document it, you know, you should be good. So that's really where this kind of goes. And why are we, why are we having this process where we're drying and then we're tearing out everything we dried because we had a, an assessment? Where does this come from, Jeremy? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this, this comes from the S500. My apologies. Okay. Okay. And, and there's, then... there's several of the, there's several areas of the document that talk about that. These are just two that I pulled out quick. I, I see a lot of complaints online again from i mean a couple of these restoration groups i just kind of keep an eye on it and um, a lot of complaints about insurance companies not being willing to pay for asbestos testing or lead testing what's your thoughts on that yeah i think that's i think that's that's fair um again i think there also needs to be a we need to redefine the expectations of asbestos right i think we a lot of the industry in general is you know stuck on this notion that if it's you know built before a certain period of time, you're not going to have the products in there, um, and you know. So again, for me, it's if we're gonna if we're gonna be doing it, we want to be proactive. Um, so I don't really again, I don't really get involved much with that on what they pay and what they don't. But but I, I but I, but I hear the same thing. I think it's again we need to educate the industry on you know what these problems are and, and show case studies and exemplars where this this was. So what we're doing now, and maybe the approach isn't going to work, and there, there can be a problem. But no, I certainly do do hear that. Yeah, I've always found it just kind of hard to believe that. How could you deny that 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 charge? I mean, these guys are going out there; they're dealing with situations, laws in this case on asbestos, especially. They have to test this stuff if they want to stay out of trouble. Why? Why does the insurance industry? And I don't know. I'm not. I shouldn't speak for the insurance industry, but why, why would they deny that? I just don't. I have a hard time uh, grappling with that. And and I don't know. And I've never really, you know, have you know, I've never had much conversation on that. My conversation has more been with just like you talked about the the consultants and the contractors that are trying to get it done, and and it's not. I I really don't know. I, mean, I, I, I still think it's going to be just something with the presumption that you know after a certain date it's not going to be there anymore. And we know that that's not hundred percent factual. And I'm not, I got the question here. Why should the insurance policy pay for everything? I agree wholeheartedly that, um, you know, insurance has to limit their claims. And if they don't, prices are going to be so high, we can't get insurance, but it seems like something as fundamental as a law that says prior to my drying this or, or disturbing this drywall and this, this, spackling and joint compound or this ceiling or this flooring, I have to, by law, have it tested by asbestos. I, I just can't figure out why that is even a question. But let's move on, Jeremy. I'm sorry. No, you're good. Next up. Okay. Right. So, that's so an example. Was, yeah, this is what I was talking about before with, and we see this a lot. So what this is, is this was a, a property that had a, a water supply pipe leak in a bathroom. So the restoration company comes out, you know, they do this, I don't know. They remove the baseboards and they do a baseboard cut. And then they have equipment set up. These are what the walls look like. Nobody looked inside of the wall. They just set up, you know, um, air movers and started blowing air. Um, no containment was set up. There is kind of a piece of plastic over top of that chair there, but <laughs> no. But this is this is more often than not. So why did we even dry at this point? Why wasn't it stopped? All the parties are you know, brought on notice and then we remediate and then move on with what needs to be tried. Because in all reality, you probably won't need to dry much because a lot of stuff is going to be torn out. So, you know, on both ends, before and after, um, it's it's important to do this. It's, you know, you're, you're reducing risk. And unfortunately, we continue to increase risk. Let's go to the next one, John. Okay, so in this, this comes into, so a lot of these that, when we're looking at them, you know, we get the document that states, okay, well, there was mold we had to remediate. And then these are three examples of, of some properties where this is what was going on with from the sampling perspective. So 
we have the first two are, um, you know, these air sampling pumps, one's sitting on the floor, one's actually just sitting inside of a cabinet. You know, it really defeats the purpose. What is the purpose of collecting an air sample in this space? Are you trying to uh, say that there's mold there through spore counts? I mean, I can look at the first one, I can see there's a ton of damage back there. There's likely mold. If you want to sample, yeah. it, sure. And then when we look at our last photograph, well, now we're sampling, you know, we're taking a surface sample, but we're sampling the bottom of a sink. <laughs> and a lot of times we're sampling these surfaces that aren't going to require remediation. They're going to require cleaning and dis you know. So it's when you start to see this, which is, okay, we, we dried, we had this, we look at what was provided to support the reasoning, and then we tear it out. Um, but this goes back to even redefining the expectation of a mold assessment. You know, why are we, why do, why is there an expectation that there should be, even the consultant themselves, why are you taking a sample in there? Um, I Bias. What, what's that? Bias. Bias. The person taking the sample, right? Yeah, it's just, it's not, it's, you know, if, if you're going to do that and you're, you have a concern with exposure and you want to use air sampling for that, um, you know, there's, Obviously, we, there's different ways to go about that, but but setting, you know, just doing this, I don't really get it. And somebody actually did talk to me about uh, the the middle picture and saying, well, aren't we? What if we're worried about our, our baby crawling across the floor? Okay, but you know, I'm be more worried about the cleanliness of that floor, um, you know, than I would be about taking a spore trap, which has so many variables to begin with. You know, even to try and interpret that data, you know, yep. let's look and see what we have. So. That's really where this goes to then is, you know, our contractors a lot of times are missing the boat with our pre-existing contamination. And then we're getting to a point to where we're doing, you know, this type of sampling to support something. And it just, it doesn't jive. Next one, John. All That's right. Good. These are, I thought this was really good here. Yeah. And these are the thoughts on this. And, and these are the questions. So these are the questions that all parties involved need to be able to answer. So, why are we removing building materials that we already dry? In a lot of these, that's what we see. So in many cases, the mold assessment is performed after drying has been completed. And when we get lucky, they've actually documented, well, the, the contract will document that it's dry. And then the assessor goes out. And then if we do, they actually may show where they took some moisture measurements and everything's dry. But then we rip everything out because they found mold. So now the problem is, well, you, you had contamination, you dried it when you should have removed it. And then... Now we've removed it because based upon a sample, you know, it seems to me that mold assessments are being used to make this leap. And I don't think it's good. It brings more scrutiny. That's what we keep talking about is people get frustrated. Well, it's because of, of things like this. It's like where more scrutiny is going to be involved and it's not best practice. So and then what I always look at as well is what value does this add? What value are you giving to your client to, you know, I, I don't see it. Just this whole walk in, take a sample, walk out. There's, there's no. And then, you know, what are we doing with the industry? Who is somebody teaching this? You know, who's how are we learning to do this? Um, you know, what are the various qualifications? You know, in states like Florida and Texas and New York, you know, you need you need licensure to do this. So, are, is that where we're learning this? I, you know, I don't know, but to me, it's like, are, are we are we really vetting our our people that are experts? Because a lot of folks think because they get a license, they're an expert. Well, no, you you met the criteria to get that license. It doesn't mean you're good at it. You know, you can have a, you know, the barber, he needs a license, but you can go there and get a really terrible haircut. Doesn't mean he's good at it. Just he, was, he got what he needed to get that license. So well, and it's 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 not only the people that get the license, it's it's the consumer. They think because someone is licensed, then they're going yes. to get a good service. And that's just not the case. I I've I don't know. I, I personally think that these state regulations have caused a lot of these problems where people now are experts after a two or three day class. And um, not only, I shouldn't say they're experts, they're licensed to do this type of work after a two or three day class. And and that's a bit scary, but go ahead, Jeremy. No, and it is. And it's, it, it comes back to the competence, right? So have you worked under somebody, you know, have you, have you learned things? So I, I always go back to, and we talked about this in Naples was, my experience at, at when I first started with, with Ralph, with Dr. Moon, and then even my colleague, Rick, who I worked with from day one till now, you know, we, you know, one thing Ralph, he wanted us to be better, would understand how to do the process right and be better. Because particularly when you are in a, a, a world of forensic, when you're an engineer, generally you're more accepted. 
It's just the way it is. As a scientist, you know, where people are always like, well, what do you mean? You're a scientist? What does that mean? Well, I'm a scientist. Yeah. I, I collect, I answer a problem or I, I answer questions and solve problems collecting data. That's what I've been doing. Um, so, but we set ourselves apart by just going the extra mile and being more and more thorough. So, but you're hundred percent right. I think it's a confidence thing and, and, and who's the mentoring and where are we getting this from? I think we've got a great question here from Susan Valenti. Jeremy, you're in the top tier of IAQA. What role should they play in these questions? I think a lot of it is it's, it's the education and even continuing to develop new education, even on something as, you know, robust and what's been talked about forever, like a mold assessment. I think if we continue to reevaluate what they are, what the expectations should be, and continue to promote that type of education, which really is following scientific methods, you know, following scientific principles and providing a, a reliable answer. Um, so, you know, IAQA, AIHA, like these associations, that's what we need to continue to do um, from, that, from that perspective. All right, let's go to the roundup, John. I got a couple good questions still remaining here. All right, I want to welcome on Tramex Meters and also the Environmental Information Association to our two newest sponsors. Jeremy, I want to quickly discuss this um, IICRC mold assessment standard. I think it's the S530. And you are the vice chair of this S530. And I'm curious, um, why do we need another mold assessment standard? I, I've always used the ASTM standard as kind of the, the, the most appropriate standard for mold inspection. Why do we need an IICRC mold, in, mold assessment standard? I, I think uh, I think two or three weeks ago, you had John Lapatero on, and he made a comment, and I think this is this is right. It's the reach of the IICRC. You know, it's the reach of them, their standards out into the general public. It's it's well understood. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know about the ASTM. And you, no matter how much you can promote it. So I think from this perspective is, is the reach. And then also taking what the ASTM is and expounding upon that, you know, drilling down a little bit more, providing a little bit more detail um, is, is, an, is another good reason. So I think in, in the end, you know, that's what we want to see. And that's where the ICRC is going to help with that. And even with our, our consensus body we have, it's very um, passionate. It's a lot of, you know, expert level folks and trying to make the industry better. So, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a good thing. Are both okay. of those standards, would you describe both of those standards as performance or prescriptive or one of each? I think they're really need, they're more standard, you know, standard of care. So really what, it's a little bit of both. I mean, when you have a standard of care, you know, what should the prudent practitioner be doing? Um, you know, I think both of those kind of fall in line with that. If I answered your question right. And well, I think, I'm gonna throw, I, I, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I was just going to say that, you know, prescriptive is telling you exactly step-by-step step how to do something. I think performance uh, is exactly what you were talking about before the expectations. Yeah, it is. So it's, it is more performance. You, you know, you can't, well, again, particularly with a mold assessment, there's just too many variables. It cannot be step by step. Right. You have to have some leeway. And, you know, there's got to be reasons why you can't do certain things. And, you know, we can't, you cannot write a standard for that because it's just, it's, we talk about it all day today. It's complex. And there's a lot going on. Understood. Agreed. And I, I think the, the one comment's important. So why doesn't IICRC just support the ASTM standard instead of reinventing the wheel? I'm not going to ask you to answer that question, but what I am going to say is it's a very, I think it's a good point. Um, you know, I, I, I have used that standard for years. I thought it was a good standard. It was developed by some really good people, but um, I don't want to put you on the spot with that one, Jeremy. What I would like you to talk to me about is um, how will this be different from or improve on the ASTM standard? Yeah, and I think that's where I was trying to hit on a little bit before is, is, is just drilling down, um, providing a little bit more guidance to those steps. Um, when you read the um, ASTM, that's good. Um, and we're just looking at that as well as what we think should be part of a mold assessment as the CV and just drilling down a little bit more. So I think it's going to be um, just a little more intensive. I don't know if intensive is the right word, 
we'll have a little bit more detail to it. It'll be a little bit more detailed. We're also gonna talk about, you know, qualifications of an IEP, um, maybe some different things that the ASTM doesn't um, touch on. So I think it's gonna be a little bit more of a broader, a broader standard in you know, the brevity, but it, well, in, in scope, but a little bit more detail. Will, will it also incorporate the condition one, condition two, condition three definitions and, and help with trying to determine what is condition one, condition two in particular? Yes, we are. Yes, that's there. And we are tackling that. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. Now, what about, uh, I got another question. What's the difference between an expert and a prudent practitioner? I'm not sure I understand, but since Susan said it was a great question, I'm going to ask it. <laughs> I know where that question came from. Um, I, I think it, so your prudent practice, so I think an expert is, has a, you have a, a skill in a certain area and they, or they could be areas that if you're highly skilled, you're highly knowledgeable in that space. I think for a prudent practitioner, you need to have, some, you need to have skill and knowledge to be able to help you to go in and to identify. So from a mold assessment perspective, if we're, if we're going in and, you know, we have, you know, a roof leak, um, has a prudent practitioner, I should be able to go in. I can identify that there's you know a problem on the ceiling. I can look up in the attic and there's a leak. Now, I'm not going to be an expert in the roof. I'm going to have to, if we need to, we'll retain somebody to go up and assess the roof. So I think from that perspective, you know, it, it, generally experts are, they're really honed in on a certain area. Um, while the prudent practitioner, you know, maybe not be that precise in a certain area, but they have an overall understanding and ability to perform the assessment. If I may, Joe, um, right, Cliff. Um, a definition that I liked about expert is the person you bring in at the last minute to share the blame. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Cliff, before I go to my last question, do you have anything you'd like to ask, Jeremy? No, no, I'm good. Thank you. Stuart. All right. I, this one's going to take a minute, so I want to make sure I get it in here. You review reports as an expert witness, and I know you've thought about this for us, and I appreciate it. What advice would you give to our audience on report writing? Yeah, so, you know, report writing, it's a science and an art. And the first thing about now, what we're talking about is what we talked about a lot today, which is providing a defensible opinion. And the first thing it starts with is a detailed and thorough assessment. If you don't do a good assessment, you're going to have a major problem trying to actually provide an opinion. So a long time ago, you know, I, I realized I would be writing a report and I started to creatively write, which meant I didn't have the, the enough information I needed. Whether I was on site, I didn't get it or it just wasn't there for me. So if you find yourself creatively writing, well, then you know that your, um, your site assessment wasn't detailed enough to get you that answer. So that's the first part of it is a, is a good assessment. So you don't have anything. Once you have it, once you do a good assessment, it's easy really to write the report. Um, it's also providing rel relevant background information. So again, these are defensible reports. What this means is you're rendering opinion and it's other people are gonna scrutinize it. So we wanna get all the background information that's available. With water losses, there's a lot going on there, right? We have anything from the property owner, we have from the restoration contractor, we can have from the contractors that did plumbing, HVAC, whatever work. So we wanna be able to look at that information and provide some kind of summary of it. So as a reader, I understand what where you're coming from and what you understood it to be. Um, and then in your observations, you know, provide some detail. Not just there was mold, there was water damage, you know, where was it? What's the extent of it? Um, if you did a moisture survey, um, what are what are those measurements? I can't tell you how many times I read a report that says we measured we used a moisture meter and there's nothing in there. That's really important when you're looking at water losses, mold assessments, things like that. So detailed observations, they don't need to be long-winded. Just let the reader know what's going on. Um, and then, you know, lay out your logic for an opinion. I think this is most important. So if you're being asked to render an opinion, is there a problem or not, or what is the problem? It's actually pretty easy for most of us that are trained to go in and look at a problem. So say I go into a, you know, a condo down here in South Florida and everything's covered in mold. Well, that's from humidity and I'm likely gonna be right. But can you get, tell me how you got from A to B. That's actually where the most important part is. That's your evaluation. That's all the, the data, the information you collected, you analyze is now just laid out. So explain how you got from A to B, even if you're right. And I think that's what makes a really good report. Um, and then a short, uh, sweet conclusion. <laughs> Make it simple. You know, 
it was from this. It was from that. Uh, as, as simple as you can be. Because in the end, you may be testifying in front of a jury. And that's what we need to do for them or even any other parties involved. So it's a detailed assessment. I think it's a you know, good background information, good observations, and then a logical support of your conclusion. Got a good comment from Dave. Nice to see you on too, David. Uh, helpful to think, I think, that all you do is likely to someday be reviewed by an attorney for the standard of care, the context of the work, and the ultimate basis of the for the recommendations. I think he kind of summarized it pretty well for you right there. Yeah, and, and be honest with you, when I write a report, I think about everybody that's on this call who's on the other end of it's going to review that report. You might be there to challenge me. And what I want from that is, is you to read it and be like, wow, this makes sense. I, I respect this guy. It still may be your job to disagree with me. But in the end, I hope that you read it and you're like, okay, this is good. Because what I don't want to be is like, wow, this is bad. And we're going to have a good time, you know, taking this guy apart. So that's yeah. another way I look at it as well as I look for my peers, my peers. I'm writing to you as well, because I want to be, you know, I want to have a, a really good document that's that stands up to your scrutiny. And Jeremy, before we go, we always ask, um, is there anything you'd like to add? Anything we missed? I don't think so. I, I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. This was this was a good we uh, we loved having you. I'm, I'm looking forward to um, seeing you again down the road and hopefully uh, kind of following along uh, as your president, hopefully down the road of IAQA, where they're headed and what they're doing. I think they've been an important group in the industry for a long time, and hopefully uh, they will continue to, be, to do so. I agree. All right. This is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to this week's guest, Jeremy Beagle. I also want to note here that um, we're going to answer a few of these questions on wood next week. I've got uh, Rob Junkman of the Canadian Wood Council coming on for our next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. I also want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls, most importantly, our growing loyal audience and sponsors will be back next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.